Hi. Hi. How are you today? I'm okay. I'm just I'm a little concerned. I'm Daniela, and I'm your student nurse, and I'm going to be talking to you about your recent diagnosis. Can you verify your name and date of birth? Sure. Absolutely. It's Marcy Romero, uh, 101117. Great. So, Marcy, I hear that you were diagnosed with impregnant endocarditis right. today. Yeah, I'm just really concerned. I have a lot of questions, a lot of fears going through my head. And I just don't really know what this is. Um, it's a really big word, and I just have no idea what's going on. Well, this is a great opportunity for me to be able to tell you a little bit about impregnant endocarditis. <laughs> okay, Marcy, now from the newsroom. We have Brian, who's going to be giving us information on the pathophysiology and etiology of infective endocarditis. Excellent! This just in from the Mayo Clinic. Infective endocarditis is an infection of the endocardial layer of the heart, primarily involving the four valves. Recall from AMP that there are three layers of the heart wall. The epicardium is the outermost layer, the visceral layer of serous, serous pericardium. The third layer is the endocardium. The endocardium is a thin sheet of endothelium that lines the heart's chambers, including the four valves, and is continuous with the endothelial linings of the blood vessels entering and leaving the heart. So, uh, how did I get infected in endocard endocarditis? endocarditis? That's a great question, Marcy. Back to the newsroom with three. Several ways to acquire endocarditis, but the most common is bacterial, caused by staph or strep. The other possible pathogens include fungi and viruses, i.e. occurs when blood turbulence within the heart allows the causative organism to infect previously damaged valves or other endothelial surfaces. There are several risk factors, cardiac and non-cardiac conditions, that can cause IE. Cardiac conditions would include having prior endocarditis, having a prosthetic heart valve, which you would see in a medical chart, abbreviated PVE, prosthetic valve endocarditis, acquired valve disease, which would include a mitral valve prolapse, aortic stenosis, other conditions such as that, uh, cardiac lesions, um, congenital heart disease, um, such as ventricular septal defect, um, pacemakers, Marfan syndrome, which is a genetic disorder of the connective tissues, cardiomyopathy, and non-cardiac conditions, which can lead to um, IE, would be hospital-acquired bacteremia, bacteremia, and IV drug abuse. This is actually the second most common cause of IE. And you will see it in a patient's chart abbreviated as IVDAIE. Um, intravenous drug abuse, infective endocarditis. So if you're at clinicals one day and you get a lot of that jargon, you'll know what that one means. Um, a procedure associated uh, intravascular devices, such as the PIC line. That's why the PIC line dressing sterilization procedure is so important. In addition, there are several high risk factor groups of individuals who are increased risk for IE and must receive prophylactic antibiotics before receiving certain procedures. Uh, prosthetic heart valve or prosthetic material used to replace a uh, heart valve, a history of IE, um, a con congenital heart defect, and a cardiac transplant. The number one most common cause of IE is aging. More than 50% of IE patients have aortic stenosis. The second most common cause is drug use. And three is the prostatic valves, and four is the intravascular de devices, and that's a healthcare associated infection. And the fifth most common cause is renal dialysis. That's it, back to you, Daniela. Thank you, Bree, that was great information. Now, knowing that, Marcy, have you ever had a pick line or an intravenous catheter? No. Any prosthetic valves that you have in your heart? No. Any congenital heart disease? No. Um, renal dialysis? No. Um, you, have you ever um, had any drug, IV drug use? No, no, no. And you're under 50, right? Yeah. How about rheumatic fever? Yes, when I was a child. You did. Mm -hmm. The rheumatic heart disease is the reason that you uh, contracted infective endocarditis. Okay, I, I get that. I'm just still a little confused about what exactly infective endocarditis is. Oh, great question. 
Back to the newsroom with Bree. Vegetations are the primary lesions resulting from IE. They consist of fibrin, leukocytes, platelets, and microbes that stick to the valve surface of the endocardium. They basically look like clusters forming around the valves. These vegetations are very fragile and can fragment off into the circulation causing emboli. As many as 50% with IE experience systematic embolization. This occurs from left-sided vegetations moving into various organs, brains, kidneys, causing limb infarction. Right-sided vegetations can move into the lungs causing pulmonary emboli. Furthermore, the infection may spread locally and damage the valves and their supporting structures. This causes dysrhythmias, valve dysfunction, and eventual invasion into the myocardium, leading to heart failure, sepsis, heart block, and could be potentially fatal. Back to you, Daniela. Thank you, Brian, again for all that wonderful information. Now, Marcy, I want to give you this handout. Um, so. Why don't you explain to me what your understanding is? Sure, absolutely. So let me just make sure I, I have this straight. So the early and acute signs and symptoms would be fever, chills, um, I'm sorry, what's that word? Malaise? That's malaise. That oh. means an overall feeling of achiness, or you don't feel good, you kind of feel fatigued, which is what you were complaining of when you came in. Right, right, okay. And body aches, um, lower back pain, joint pain. And then I have the later signs and symptoms would be a change in mental status. Um, so I'd like maybe just not feeling quite right, um, headaches, extreme fatigue. Um, and then I guess it can progress and you can have later signs and symptoms. Um, so some of the skin symptoms I'm understanding would be Osler nodes. Um, Great question, Marcy. Let's take a look at a picture of an Osler node. They're really painful nodes that you can get anywhere on the extremities, which could be hands, sometimes feet. The picture that we're looking at is of hands, and as you can see, it looks very red and painful, okay? Um, you can also get splinter hemorrhages, which is what we're looking at now, and that is little hemorrhages underneath your nail beds that appear as little black lines. And as you can see, those look painful as well. And what are Janeway's lesions? Janeway's lesions are little small painless lesions on the palms and the soles of your hands. Um, primarily they're on the palms of the hands and as you can see in the picture we're looking at, they just look like um, they're little areas where the skin has broken. The way I'm understanding peripheral edema is it's a curving of the nail due to a depletion of oxygen or? The clubbing is what you're describing. Okay. It's the curving of the nail due to the depletion of oxygen, peripheral edema is just swelling oh. of your hands or your feet. Okay, easy enough. So then some of the other progressive symptoms would be respiratory, would be shortness of breath, um, crackles, uh, listening when you're listening to the lung sounds, um, tachypnea, is that when you're breathing really fast? That is. Okay, excellent. Um, cardiovascular signs would be dysrhythmia, um, tachycardia, fast heartbeat. Fast heartbeat. New murmurs, um, S3 and S4 noted? What, what are those? S3 and S4 are different sounds that your healthcare oh. professional will hear when they're listening to you with a stethoscope. Okay. So you can ask about those and they can, they can look and or they can listen. Okay, um, retinal hemorrhages. And then I have it here in really bold letters, embolite of brain, um, CVA, renal failure, heart failure, pulmonary embolism and death. That's really scary. Those, those do sound really scary, and those are what we're trying to avoid by treating your infective endocarditis. So if one of those little vegetation spots that we saw the video for earlier breaks off and goes up into the brain, that's how you the emboli can go to your brain, which causes a stroke, it can cause death, and again, that's what we're trying to avoid. That's why it's so important that we take care of this now. All right, okay. Um, so lab and diagnostic findings, um, Leukocytosis. I think I know what that is. Is that an increase in white blood cell counts? Perfect. Okay, great. Anemia, um, increased ESR, and increased CRP. I'm not sure what that is. The increased ESR and CRP is basically just looking for inflammation, any markers of inflammation um, that your blood can tell us about. Okay. Um, increased cardiac enzymes. 
uh, positive blood cultures. Is that when they're checking for the bacteria? That is. Okay. Um, hematuria, an echocardiogram, <clears throat> and that will show chamber enlargement, valvular dysfunction, and the vegetations that you talked about. That's right. And the doctor will tell you all about that when they read the echocardiogram. Okay. Um, and then I also have here a chest x-ray showing cardiomegaly. What's that? Cardiomegaly is an increased size of the heart. Okay, and pulmonary infiltrates? Pulmonary infiltrates are blood or pus that can be in your lungs. All right, and then lastly, an ECG showing ischemia and conduction defects. ECG is another term for EKG. They're kind of intermixed, so it's the same, same test that we were talking about earlier. All right, um, so for medical treatment, um, IV antibiotic treatment in high doses, um, bed rest, which I understand is patient has a fever or I'm feeling really tired. Um, valve replacement, am I going to have to have my valve replaced? Um, right now that's something that the doctor will decide. Right now we're not looking at valve replacement, we're just looking at prolonged um, antibiotic therapy, but it is something that you may want to discuss with your doctor in the future. Okay, and then some things that you just talked to me that I need to do at home would be just a plan for adequate, adequate periods of rest, right. so maybe just not do too much in one day. And, and plan for periods of downtime. Um, I need to monitor my body temperature closely. I need to monitor for signs and symptoms of life-threatening complications. So um, if I notice like a change in my mental status or if I start getting short of breath, I'm gonna let someone know. Um, if I have unexplained weight gain or edema, I'll be sure to let you guys know. Um, and then I'll just keep a close watch on my anxiety and the stress factors in my life. Um, Cause I know you talked to me about that. Am I going to have to administer antibiotic therapy and monitor my lab values constantly? Um, actually, you're going to have to take your, you'll take your round of antibiotics that we've prescribed to you, and then you're going to come in periodically for a um, lab test, for a blood test that we're going to give to you, and we'll monitor those numbers for you and let you know if there's something that needs that is of a, a concern. Okay, excellent. I think that's it. So, Marcy, now that we've gone over everything, um, there are a few things that I really need you to know. I'm going to go over those with you now. So, according to the recent, most recent guidelines set forth by the American Heart Association, antibiotic prophylaxis with dental procedures is reasonable only for patients with cardiac conditions associated with the highest risk of adverse outcomes from endocarditis. That includes prosthetic cardiac valves, um, previous diagnosis of endocarditis, congenital heart disease only if um, there's unrepaired cyanotic congestive heart disease and or completely repaired congenital heart disease. If there's a cardiac transplant with a cardiac valvular disease. Now because you've had endocarditis now, you are falling within those high risks. So if you get oh. any dental work at all, I need you to um, let us know so that we can put you on prophylactic antibiotic, which means that we're going to prevent an infection. Oh. It doesn't mean that you already have one. Oh. We're going to prevent it with that. Okay, makes okay. sense. Thank you. So, Daniela, um, are there any complications I need to know about? That's a great question, Marcy. Mm -hmm. To answer that question, we're going to break to the newsroom one last time with Brianne. Breaking news from the Mayo Clinic with the complications of IE. Congestive heart failure is the most common serious complication of infective endocarditis and is the leading cause of death among patients with this infection. In patients with severe heart failure, unresponsive to medical therapy after 24 to 48 hours, prompt cardiac valve replacement should be considered, irrespective of the duration of preoperative antimicrobial therapy. We believe that all patients with bacterial infective endocarditis who are stable hemodynamically and who have had not had multiple large emboli should receive at least one course of antimicrobial therapy in an attempt to sterilize the infected valve before cardiac valve replacement is considered. Most patients with multiple major embolic embolic events should undergo cardiac valve replacement or debridement of the infected valve. Limited the technical limitations and the experience with two-dimensional echocardiogram in patients with infective endocarditis who have had valve vegetations demonstrated by echocardiography are not yet sufficient to justify cardiac valve replacement solely on the basis of echocardiographic findings. The highest frequency of major embolic events occurs
occurs in association with infection, infections that produce large mobile bowel vegetations, such as those caused by para influenza and other slow growing fastidious gram negative bacilli. Fungi, especially Aspergillus, and nutritional, nutritionally varied forms of streptococci. Well, that's it on infective endocarditis. You've been a great audience. Thanks, Brian. That was a lot of information. So, Marcy, now that we've gone over all that information, do you have any other questions that I can help you with? No, it's, it's kind of overwhelming right now. I just have a lot of information going through my head and so many thoughts. I need to kind of digest everything and, and think it through. I understand that. I've given you the phone number here at the clinic. You can call okay. me um, anytime that you have a question. Just leave a message for me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Okay. Um, maybe if you want to write, when you think of a question, write it down so that you don't forget. Okay, like I'm a notebook. Absolutely. Okay. And then we can go over those whenever you want. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I wanted to go over some of the nursing diagnoses that we might use with infective endocarditis. Now these nursing diagnoses you can get out of the Agley Nursing Diagnosis book. Um, the first one I wanted to go over was acute pain related to inflammation of the myocardium or pericardium or systemic effects of infection on ischemic tissue. This is as evidenced by chest pain um, spreading to the neck, back, and joints with increased pain on deep inspiration, movement activities, position, fever, and chills, which we know are clinical manifestations of infective endocarditis. Another nursing diagnosis um, that I wanted to mention was activity intolerance related to inflammation and degeneration of myocardial muscle cells. This is as evidenced by complaints of weakness, fatigue, malaise, dyspnea with activity, changes in signs of activity, or signs of chronic heart failure. Um, another endocarditis nursing diagnosis would be knowledge deficit about condition. Um, this is related to lack of information about the disease. This is why patient teaching is so important and how to prevent reoccurrence or complications. This is as evidenced by requests for information, failure to improve, or reoccurrence and complications that could have been prevented. The last nursing diagnosis that I wanted to go over was anxiety, related to fear of death because of the new health status. This is as evidenced by insomnia, expressed concerns, difficulty concentrating, increased healthlessness, and worry. Um, so the patient is very worried about their of impending death from this, so we need to educate them. Thank you for watching our video. And thank you to our director. This is my son, Mencislava Romero. He recorded it, and he's going to produce this and edit for us. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Enjoy your movie.